I'm excited to talk to you all today about Elm and how it helps us to make reliable web apps and particularly how we can do that while avoiding JavaScript fatigue. Not JavaScript completely, but JavaScript fatigue particularly. And to start out, I'll give a little bit of my experience of using uh, JavaScript and some of the fatigue that I've had. And then I'll ask you all a few questions and then I will try to define what JavaScript fatigue is for me and how Elm has helped me solve it. So I've been writing software for a little over a decade now. And when I started in college, I was learning Java. And then my first job, I was learning C Sharp. And really, it was pretty similar. A lot of the same concepts, uh, similar syntax. And then I started using JavaScript right after. And that really became my first programming love language. I enjoyed it because I could write programs in many different ways. So I could maybe write a little bit of object-oriented code, some functional code, and I could express myself various ways. But what I found was there was this inconsistency. So I may have this one design pattern over here and another one over here. And when I was working by myself, that was no problem because I knew where I was going with it, right? But when I got onto a bigger team, I found that that inconsistency leaked. And so someone may ask me, well, is this the right way of doing it? Or I may do a, a, on a pull request that say, hey, no, go check out this file. That's, that's not a great way to, to work. So that was exacerbated when I was, became a tech lead on projects. Then I had to figure out, as being more responsible, how to make this application reliable enough. And that was expounded by being in healthcare and the expectation of reliability in that environment. And then I started using, uh, that's when I was introduced to Elm and found that it helped me solve a lot of those issues. And, and I found then, um, I started doing some Elm consulting and that it was useful in other situations, not just this one domain. So now, uh, I want to ask you all a few questions. I'm going to move to the middle here so I can see by raise of hands. How many of you have experience with JavaScript, HTML, CSS? Excellent. That's what I wanted to hear. Um, any folks with TypeScript or React Reason experience? Any of those? Okay. And has anyone heard of Elm, used Elm? I, all right. Wow. That's great. Okay. Um, so what is JavaScript fatigue? And I think this, you're not going to be able to read this very well, and that's okay. It's a roadmap of front end and, and well, all the things we need to learn as front end developers. And I think this really gives a good idea of it. And not even being able to read it, like first things are HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then TypeScript or Reason, or you know, what framework are we going to use? So we have to make a lot of decisions. And that to me leads to fatigue. And so I describe that as overload of all these different decisions, micro decisions we have to make, new frameworks, new libraries, the versions, the forks of those. I used Node.js for a while, and at one point it was forked into IOJS. And so um, it was very overwhelming for me anyway. And, and then as I was working on projects, and maybe I would do due diligence at the beginning of a project and figure out you know, which of these technologies fits the problem that I'm trying to solve best. And then I would figure out, okay, I've picked this and I've picked that, and then now, how do those things fit together, right? Like, can I use Reason with Angular or TypeScript with React? And so, you're probably thinking now, well, why Elm, right? Because I've just told you that you shouldn't be overwhelmed by all these different JavaScript frameworks. Well, Elm's a little bit different because and I'll share exactly why it's different. So if you'll just bear with me for a moment here, we'll get into that. So Elm solves this problem of overload with a cohesive ecosystem. And for one, it's a language. So it's a statically typed functional language and it compiles to JavaScript. So there's a compiler, right? And that compiler has nice error messages. And there's a single framework. So now we don't have to make that decision of do we use React or do we use Vue.js or do we use, there's, there's a bunch of them. 
And then it's also a package manager, and we'll get into some of the features of that here in a little bit and how it's unique. And this is last but certainly not least, it's a community. And one of my first forays into Elm was going to ElmConf in St. Louis a couple of years ago, and I really got to meet the people that were kind of leading this technology. And it was exciting to me to see these ideas that these folks had and how, they, how open they were to share those with other people. So what else is JavaScript fatigue? Uncertainty. <laughs> we're guarding against null and undefined all the time. And for me, I was trying to figure out, you know, how many tests do I need to write to cover this? And I think we'll learn a little bit later about some techniques to cover that. But still, as you're writing an application, and particularly if you want to refactor that application and say, well, you know, as my business changes, maybe this doesn't make sense as one thing. Maybe I need to break it up into a couple of things, or maybe I just need to move things around. I, I used to be really afraid of that when I'd write JavaScript. And I maybe not design it the best way because, well, I would either have to write a bunch more tests, which that was overwhelming, that was overload, or maybe I would be offloading more work onto the QA team. So how does Elm solve that? Well, it's reliable. And so don't take my word for it. I'll, I'll try and explain a little bit as we go along. But this comes from the website. It says, no runtime exceptions in practice. And then here's an anecdote from Richard Feldman. He is a software engineer at No Red Inc. And they have one of the largest Elm code bases in production. And it says, after two years and 200,000 lines of production Elm code, they got a runtime exception. And so they use this function that if you call it, it intentionally throws an exception. There's one function in Elm that does that. They used it. It made it into production. And the interesting part, another interesting part is it says their JavaScript crashed 60,000 times in that period. So that's a stark difference. So how does it do that? Well, one is, and this is, you probably can't see this very well over here, maybe a little bit better over here. But this is an actual error message from the Elm compiler, and it shows here that there's a type mismatch, person does not have a field named N-A-E-M, and then it shows the line and even underscores part of the line where there's the issue. And it gives us the type, and it says it doesn't contain this field. And then this is the really cool part, it gives us a hint. Because we made a typo, it could find this other field that was really closely named. And so this is really convenient. And there are other ways that Elm has these really world-renowned error messages. And it has influenced other languages. But sometimes they'll have links to describe how you can solve these problems. And so in Elm, there's no null or undefined. But we still have unknowns, right? We have to figure out how we can handle those things with the language. And again, this one you probably can't read very well, so I'm going to walk back over here. You can think of this, we're not going to understand the whole syntax here, probably, if you're not familiar with Elm. But from looking at this, I think of this person as kind of like a table schema. Or it's called a record, but you might think of it like a, a POCO object or a, a DTO. So you're just kind of describing this person it has a name, which is a string, and that's all standard fare. And then there's age, which is maybe int. And that's the interesting part of this definition. And so I think to get a little bit of an idea of how this works, I want to give two examples here of creating records. We create Tom, who has a name, which is a string, and that's hopefully pretty straightforward. And then age, but we don't say his age is 42. We say it's just 42. So there's this keyword that comes beforehand. And then to contrast that with Sue, we don't know her age. So of course, we give her a name, and that's a string. That's fine. And then age equals nothing. So we have a way to describe that in Elm. And so from the look of this, it, this probably doesn't look a whole lot different than just saying you know, her age is null. But I think in this next slide here, we'll see. Excuse me. What yeah. does just mean? So it's a type variant. And it's, it's defined in the language so that you can have unknowns. And what it is is a keyword that comes before whatever that value is. So I think this example here will, I don't know why I walked back over there. <laughs> 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 I 
this example here will hopefully explain that a little bit better. So in this, we're going to create a function that says we're going to convert a person's age to a string. It takes in the person, and then we do an expression on that person's age, a case expression. And you can think of this like a switch. But there are two variants here. There's just age, and this is when there is an age. And then we can use this right here, age, to actually get the value from that. So we're going to convert it from an integer to a string. But we also have to handle the case when we don't know what their age is. So when it's nothing, then we return whatever. In this case, we return unknown. So it's kind of like pattern matching on these different options. And one important thing to note is that in Elm, it's exhaustive, meaning you must handle all these cases in the application. And so that's how we're able to avoid null or undefined. And so another thing about JavaScript fatigue, for me anyway, is you know, there's the sun, and it's pretty heavy. And there's a neutron star, and those are heavy. Er, and black holes are really heavy. But node modules folder is off the charts, right? <laughs> I mean, for me anyway, the sheer number of dependencies when I install something, it can be overwhelming. You know, going back to that overload feeling. And then when you want to actually move this thing into production, you have to think about, well, if you're not using something like LiveView, you have to figure out, you know, how do I reduce these asset sizes? And maybe you do some tree shaking, or maybe you do some code splitting to figure that out. But there's some work involved with that for somebody. And then this one for me, from my experience, I was working on a Node project and we deployed to QA, everything went fine, and then we deployed to production and it, it broke. And this was before there was a package lock, so this may have solved that problem, but what we ended up with doing was going through all of our dependencies, took three developers and just figured out which one, which of the changes broke this. And that's an experience I never wanted to have to deal with again. Um, and if you've done it, ran an NPM install recently, you probably have had warnings and security issues come up. So those things are overwhelming. Those, those are things you have to deal with as a developer. And so Elm solves this with a safe package manager. And what I mean by that, one of my favorite parts is this example here. And this is a little bit washed out on this side. So move back over here. This is a command line tool that allows us to see differences in packages in the Elm ecosystem. So right now we're looking at the differences between this package between version 1.0.0 and 2.0.0. And it automatically detects that this is a major change and it tells us what has changed. It's this right here. Part of the type of these functions has changed. And Elm enforces semantic versioning automatically. And that was one of the things that really drew me in. What I didn't expect to enjoy about Elm was how the packages are required to not have side effects, meaning you can't call JavaScript directly in Elm. And one of the benefits of that is that you can identify security concerns clearly because in the Elm architecture, there's, and this is the single framework that I'm talking about here, there's only one place where you will actually be able to ha create side effects. So if you are using a package that happens to be called from that area of your code, you know, well, there might be a security risk here. The rest of your code, you just don't worry about it. And another, yeah? Could you compare that with uh, pure scripts FFI? Uh, I'm not super familiar with pure scripts FFI, but um, I think they're allowed to call directly into JavaScript. Is that is that right? Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. So it's like an escape hatch, right? Um, Elm does not have an escape hatch in that regard. Um, there is a way to interact with JavaScript, but it's much more walled off. Um, and, and so if you're going to have an exception, it's definitely going to be on your JavaScript side. Um, otherwise, you have to handle it in Elm. And, and there's a bunch of different ways. And at the end here, I'll kind of show you all some, um, some additional resources. And, and um, there will actually be a workshop this afternoon 
um, by Mike Onslow. So I recommend going to that and, and getting a, a better feel for how those type of things are handled. It's a good question. So the package ecosystem, not having side effects, one of the, another one of the benefits is that right now it compiles to JavaScript, right? But in the future, it could compile to WebAssembly. And this is easier because packages can't directly call into JavaScript. So we know that there's a smaller set of things that the core team has to figure out in order to make that possible. And another benefit is that it allows us to do asset optimization, you know, right? We were talking about heaviest objects in the world, right? Well, with Elm, there's a single compiler flag, hyphen, hyphen, optimize, and it does all that for you. It figures it out. And you can compare that, you can look at this. This is on the Elm website. It has a Vue.js project. This is all the same uh, implementation. It's called Real World App, and it's uh, a blog app. Um, so you can look at the, the Vue.js and the Angular version and React, and you can see how much smaller Elm is. Well, because of the way the language is designed and the restrictions on packages in Elm, they were able to go down to the function level, granular removal. So if you're only using two functions in one of your dependencies, then those will be the only two functions that are pulled into your code base. So really cool, my opinion. And so as we've been talking, we were on overload 1.5.2 at the beginning. Overload 2.0 came out. <laughs> uh, right? So. <laughs> What do I mean? I'm talking about there are other things that can be overwhelming about JavaScript and front-end development, really. And there's different versions of JavaScript, right? Each year now, a new version comes out. And so we have to learn new things. And so if there, yeah. All right, I'm going to try and do a vignette diagram because I wanted to put one up here, but I just didn't get around to it, to be honest. So if you have... ES5 here. So you're going to have ES6 that you have to learn, ES7, right? You get the idea there. And so that, that grows. You can't get rid of those existing features in JavaScript. And the reason for that is it's going to run in the browser, right? And it has to be backward compatible. And if you are working in the React environment, you're learning reason syntax on top of it, and you're probably learning uh, some templating like JSX, right? Or maybe you're using TypeScript. And TypeScript is also a superset of JavaScript, meaning that you learn all these and you learn TypeScript, right? That's overwhelming to me. And I'm coming from someone, as someone with a background in C Sharp, so the creator of C Sharp has also created TypeScript. So a lot of the similar ideas and syntax even, but it's just, it's a lot to take in for me. So Elm solves this with its simplicity and ease of use. And by that, I mean that there's an intentional one way to do things in Elm. And, and this comes from uh, the, all the way from the very creator of, first creator of Elm, Evan Chaplicki, and um, this leads to few key words in the language. And it can actually become simpler over time because there's a compiler. If they find that something is confusing and this has happened, they will change the way it works in the language. And you get that new version. You run your compiler. You say, oh, I need to change this. You change that thing. It compiles. And now you have some simpler code. And one really nice thing that I like is that they have focused releases, meaning that they really focus on creating nice APIs and making the language easier to use over time. And that, to me, makes me a happier developer. And you know, to recap, the cohesive ecosystem, it's reliability instead of the uncertainty and having a safe package manager, which there's another point I didn't bring up earlier. They must have documentation in order to go to be published. So I thought that was an interesting thing that they could 
um, enforce that. And it's simply and easy to use. And maybe my favorite is now I enjoy refactoring. Whereas before I was afraid of doing so, even though by nature of business, it will change, right? I couldn't do that before. Now I, I do it all the time. In fact, sometimes I will intentionally break my code to remind, give myself a reminder of, hey, I need to work on this thing maybe tomorrow. You know, it's the end of the day. I'm going to break something. And before I would even, even in compiled languages like C Sharp or Java, I would avoid compiler errors at all costs just because of the errors I, I really didn't understand them completely, you know, or they would be so cryptic I didn't want to try to understand them more like it. Um, but now I can change some code, see this nice compiler error message, go fix that piece of code, and then change it in another place and another place. And there are some um, tools within your IDEs that allow you to do some automatic renaming. If you've used something like ReSharper or IntelliJ, um, you can use those type of things as well. And at this point, I know you're all saying I'm convinced. I understand if not really, but you're probably asking, well, how do I use Elm, right? Well, yeah. Right. So this question is about um, comparing uh, ECMAScript 5, 6, 7, 8, all the new versions for <clears throat> versus new versions of Elm. And so it is a little bit different because, actually quite a bit different, because with JavaScript you have to maintain compatibility with all of those older versions. All those things that existed in ES5, if they made something that they didn't, they found out later they didn't really like that design, well, guess what? Like, you have to proliferate it because it has to run in the browser. But Elm compiles to JavaScript, so it can output whatever with different Elm. So you would have to change your code when a new version of Elm is released. Um, but what I really like is that um, they have a mentality of, um, and I believe this is a quote from, or a paraphrase quote from Evan Chaplicki, the creator of Elm, that it's better to do things right than to do them right now. So sometimes they will take a little bit longer to make a great design so that there are fewer of those breaking changes that they have to make. But that's a great question. Another quick question on that. Mm -hmm. Is there like, a, does Elm do things like Stackage where they try to have a selected set of everything, all the packages that are compatible with each other? Or is it, Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, are there like stacks within Elm where you can know that all these things are compatible? There are some of those where it's like these things we know work really well together and uh, the community is really good about, you know, kind of highlighting. If somebody has a question, um, they'll, they'll also handle X, Y problems. So that's why instead of you'll seeing a lot of questions and answers on Stack Overflow, um, a lot of communication happens through Slack or blog posts. So people can figure out what their root problem is and then figure out what they're trying to solve with that problem and then give them suggestions, like you said, of like, you know, maybe these okay. packages were worked okay. together on that. Sorry, I, I didn't mean Stack Overflow. I meant um, there's, there's a site called Stackage, which yeah. is, are you familiar with that, right? Yeah, so, so yeah, but to, the, to answer your question of are there ways to, to figure out like what things work together, because it's all statically typed, really, the way to do is to look at the type signatures, and it will and it will let you know. I mean, you just you can read right there and see whether it will work together. But at a larger scale of kind of like you know, do these things work well together? Are they kind of meant to work together? That is more of kind of a community type thing where you you figure out what you're per trying to solve, and then they help you figure out what tools best solve that problem. Okay. And then do they like if you have if you're importing a package and you also already imported another package and they both have dependencies that are different versions, how does it deal with that? Or yeah, so there is a, um, I think it's a third party tool, um, but there's a community tool where you can look at different dependencies that you have and figure out, you know, which, how, what needs to be updated and how do those all match out? Yeah, that's a, those are great questions. Um, 
but yeah, so embedding into an existing app, this is what I recommend for getting started. Oh. For getting started with Elm, particularly if you're trying to introduce it at work, um, at every company that I've used Elm, um, this is what has worked. And you can do this with vanilla JavaScript. It's just a couple lines of code. In this example, I'll run back over here. This is what you might have in your HTML file with your compiled output Elm code right here. And then you have the element that you want your Elm application to run in. So you could have other things on your page, of course. And then there's, whoops, this little line right here, which bootstraps the app. And that's it. And this is what I did for this presentation. So this is actually written in Elm. And my HTML page looks, markup looks almost exactly like that. So what next? I definitely recommend checking out Mike Onslow's Elm workshop this afternoon. And outside of that, go into the Elm guide, the official Elm guide. It's written really well, in my opinion. And it's written by the creator of Elm. So you get insight into why he made some of the decisions he made. And you can also try it online. There's an editor called Ellie. And it's kind of like JS Bin or JS Fiddle. And then you can, of course, um, if you want to try it, it's a low risk if you embed it into an existing app. You don't like the way that that thing works. You can always pull it out and try something else. It's not a, a big investment or a big bet the farm on this Greenfield app. And so the slides are at absence.gitlab.com slash elm hyphen dtw. That's GitLab, not GitHub. And you can find me everywhere as at absence with a Y, Twitter, GitHub. So I'll post my slides on Twitter. And they're already on, oh no, they're on GitLab. You can find me on there too, as absence. Um, yeah, so thank you.